Alright, I know I said I'm not showing you guys all the secrets, but since people kept bugging me about the super shotgun on the first level of episode one, I gotta let y'all see this one. Welcome to the facilities, and oh boy, this one's a little harder. This is what I'm talking about. Look at all of these guys. I want to give my endless appreciation to David Szymanski for making these enemies not hit scanners. I like how this episode starts with waves of soldiers and a million fireballs flying at you. Gives me that nice feeling that my enemies are throwing everything they've got at me. You'll meet the welders here who are fairly tough and are introduced shooting fireballs at you from across the map. The projectiles are even faster in Cerro Mieto, and this episode I might actually pronounce that correctly, we'll see. When you kill a welder, they'll fly backwards and explode, which is good for crowd control, and if you jib them, they'll just explode instantly. Trying to take them out from all the way over here sucks and you should get closer, and by that I mean, take this secret here. It'll drop you right into the shit, but it gives you a hunting rifle, which is the best way to deal with welders. This is gonna be a lot more enemies than you're used to if you've only played episode one. You're not gonna see many Black Phillips or Scarecrows or any Scarecrows. There are a few Black Phillips inside a couple secrets in the- Just from this level, you can tell the episode is gonna be a little different. Everything's a little bigger, more impressive, and I don't remember any of the maps in the first episode being this, uh, tall and open. This level's about introducing you to the newfound verticality of Dusk, so they give you the climbing power-up. For a limited time, you can press the walk button to cling to walls and you can wall jump, and that's cool. Just climb up that grain silo and ignore the secret route that I'm taking to get the fast fire power-up. This power-up respawns when it runs out, so you can just keep using it. Good stuff, but don't think you're getting out of this level without pain. Cause Eb Duke Boss is back again, yee! Yeah! <laughs> the Duke Mages, or Grand Wizards, are like the mages with more health, home and fireball attacks, and I hate them. I try to stay out of their field of view entirely and pick them off with the crossbow. Don't get me wrong, I don't mind enemies that provide a challenge to the player. So you're just walking around, having some fun, nobody's trying to kill you, you even pick up a key, right, and nothing happens. All the soldiers down here are already dead. We're having a good time, twirling our guns around. And as a side note, I hope that Switch players will be able to break their Joy-Cons doing this. Don't go in the ruins. Oh no, it's cool, I have guns. This is a little spookier than I would have thought. Uh... Oh shit, 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 shit! I personally love the Wendigos. Some people don't. I think they're one of the most quintessentially Dusk enemies in Dusk. One of those little additions that adds that Dusk flavor in. The Wendigo is invisible until you shoot it. You can hear its breathing, and even better, sometimes you can see it pushing objects around as it charges at you. It also leaves bloody footprints, and it's got a little scare cord when it appears, and if the scare cord was annoying, none of this would work. But it's not, so they're my favorite. They're usually not a problem for me unless they're in tight corners or higher numbers, and higher numbers means more than one. The Wendigo only has a melee attack. It makes up for this by having a ton of health, like two or three super shotgun blasts worth. We don't have any specific enemy data like in older games. We don't have the source code. So this is how we measure things now. It's scientific. Shut up. I don't know how this mortar counts as a secret, but it does. We're gonna need it, even if I picked up the Riveter already. Episode 2 requires a more tactical approach to blowing everything up.
There are a few places where episode 2 will kill you quick compared to episode 1, which is fine. The game needed more challenge to it. The levels are usually more claustrophobic and downright scarier, full of industrial machinery starting with Into the Thresher, which, before you go into, you have a big outdoor fight, so just disregard what I'm saying, I don't know what I'm talking about. This is the first fight that gave me trouble in this episode, mostly because of the Grand Wizards. Hunting rifle and crossbow are essential, even more than the super shotgun. Bouncing mortars around corners to take out any smaller enemies waiting for you is also helpful, and since you've got a ton of mortar ammo, like I was at capacity for a while, and capacity is 50, which is twice as much ammo as you get for the Riveter, it takes some getting used to. There's a secret super shotgun at the beginning of this level too, get that. This level also introduces turrets. They're gun turrets, another enemy that can be destroyed easily with a precise shot from the hunting rifle. There's this thing that Dusk does, which I like, where you have these little light glows on objects and enemies that makes them easy to identify from far away. Makes it so that it never feels cheap when you don't see them. They're right there. That green mist is a mage, the purple one is a grand wizard. And giving the bullet spamming turrets an easily identifiable visual cue from across the map is, well, that's just good design. You've probably all played a game where everything just blends together into the background so you don't know what you're shooting at, but those fucking wind physics, man, all those leaves, those god rays, and whoever invented Bloom? I'm never gonna get tired of that grade screen, you kids of the Discord know. So you go into this horrible grinding machine of death, look to your left and notice that there's a switch that turns off the horrible grinding machine of death. Congratulations, you're inside the infernal machine. The fall broke your flashlight. The flashlight takes falling damage. You crawl around in this intimidating but not actually that difficult area lit well enough so that you don't get crushed and... Oh yeah, the staggering amount of gore running through this giant murder machine must be thousands of human beings. There's so much gore that you become desensitized to it. Half the floors in this map are just solid gore. Part of the infernal machine is this vision-screwing grinder hallway. This isn't old school. I mean, it's cool, but all these moving brushes would make the Quake engine cry. There's this cool little shortcut that takes you back to the area you need the yellow key for. But also there's this crack in the floor and a secret underneath that with a mysterious grate. Right before you exit the map, there's a crack on the wall you can blow up, which gives you a room full of monsters and goodies. And a switch that opens that grate. If you didn't find that earlier secret, you're gonna have no idea what this one's about. And if you didn't notice that teleporter off to the side, good luck getting out the way you came in. And bam! Secret level, the Foundry. Seems like a normal enough level until you're faced with these huge pits of lava. You get a power-up that lets you walk on lava and it's like... Oh, no way! I'm being told that this is our 1,000th Rise of the Triad reference on this show. No more. So you get out of the secret level, and then you're in the... The Escher Labs. Well, this is where the game takes a turn, kids. It's... Oh, it's magical. I'm gonna let you in on a little behind-the-scenes lore on this one. So David Szymanski is going along making episode two right. And he's like, I know how this episode is going so far, but only up until map five. It's gonna be a cool science lab. But then he got bored because it was gonna just be a bunch of boxy rooms with science equipment in them. So... I had to get creative, and eventually I had the idea. Wait, what if it's a boring lab, but then it transforms into non-Euclidean insanity? That's a good read if you've got the time about how limitation could breed creativity in game design. Yeah, you're bouncing around this lab. I got some welders to infight. There's some intercoms scattered around with voice messages. Dr. Memes, please report to Executive Austria's office immediately. Uh-huh, that checks out. You get a special new power-up in this map. The Serum of Blistering Heat. It is... It's super hot. It's the super hot power-up. That's what it is. I'd be pissed off, but it's well implemented and fun to use, so here we go. Go on. Take it. Taste the power. Time only moves when you do. Or rather, time moves very, very slowly, unless you're moving. This was just too cool to not make it into the video. No, not that part. See, the crossbow has more recoil than the other weapons. You can basically fly with it. And this power-up...
Once you're done with that, you enter this little room here and... Oh, hold on. Oh no, oh god, why did I do that? So this level gets weird fast. Just in time for a boss fight with Mama. She's, uh, she's a pain. Two hits and you're done. Let's get ready for her. I'm gonna arrange these barrels right here, okay? Yeah, there we go. We just hit this button here, uh, blow up the barrels with the crossbow, and I'm having some, some trouble aiming, and... Okay, nailed it. That's not ominous at all. You thought the Fork Maidens were dangerous. Meet the Cowgirls. They're the most dangerous common enemy in the game as far as I'm concerned. They can tank four or five rivets and also shoot rivets. Okay, they look like really fast mortar shells, but they might as well be rivets. Welcome to the Erebus Reactor. It's a big open level with lava pits and surrounding buildings, and I don't know if it's a reference to Doom's Mount Erebus level, but I'm just gonna assume that it is and move on. Good level, though. It's one where you have to be careful and make sure you take out whatever's already spawned or else you will get overwhelmed. Once you get outside... The sky opens up. You got this huge city all around you. And also... Big John. Kill me! Kill me! Come on! Now! Come on, kill me! Girly man! <laughs> Big John, the legend. Maybe you guys have played Rise of the Triad 2013, and so you've seen him before. You ugly son of a bitch! Come on! Come on, do it! Come on! Come on, kill me! <laughs> Big John, Come on, kill me! Good now! I fucking love Big John. He warms my heart. Now let's give him the shaft. I know I talked shit about Unity that one time because of its accessibility and the fact that people use it to make Babby's first game and throw it up on Steam. I know, but I said that shit on YouTube so I'm gonna be getting comments about it after me and everybody else watching this video is dead. After Escher Labs, every level in Dust gets more distinct and memorable. Neo Babel is a big metal sky lab, and after that, in Blood and Bone, you crash right back down to the ground. You know, you go underground. With his sparks. We take from men that which has never been taken before. Oh yeah, you think that scares me? Oh god, my flashlight's broken. No, oh, god, oh god, a flashlight. The ruins held knowledge. We sold our souls for it. Altars filled with concrete. Fed with blood and bone. Uh, oh, you're fuck! Only takes one when to go. I guess I'm not supposed to be here either, even though this is in bounds. Oh well, what does this machine do? Uh, okay, that's gross. Do you see? Do you understand? Nope, not even a little bit. This might be over my head. Kind of sciency. Maybe a Ross Scott kind of thing? The dig. Oh, the dig. Let's see how fast this one goes bad. I still love him. I'm jumping off this cliff and not finding a secret. All I'm doing is seeing the rest of the level.
If you hadn't noticed, things are getting progressively spookier, and no amount of shotguns is making it any better. This dig is pretty obviously evil, but so is this trap. Props on this elaborate looking library secret. I didn't find the intended way in and Rivet jumped up there. See, I want to have arrows left for the final boss and I also want rivets left. It's like, okay, we're not there yet because it's boss rush time. Take this teleport and look directly behind you and you'll see this child's drawing of the wife of Intoxicator, which was drawn by a sixth grader and included in the game because sometimes wholesome heartwarming shit makes it into these games and despite my best efforts into this show. So you've got the Intoxicator, the wife of Intoxicator, what else could you? Oh, you gotta be fucking kidding me. He's a little hardier than his dad. His toxic spit seems to hurt more. Two hits at 100 HP will kill ya. But then it's on to the next- Nope! Two extra strength cowgirls! Okay, but once they're dead, it's- MOTHERFUCKER! Okay, now, now it's time for the boss. The Guardian. Who's something. I can't tell what. Whatever he is, he spams mortar at you. He has a giant health pool, and is best dealt with by either hitting him through a wall with a crossbow, or quickly attacking him with the riveter and getting out of the way. Like all the bosses in Dusk, you can choose not to kill him, get yourself a pacifist trophy, and just outmaneuver him and hit all these switches to open the portal. But what fun is that? He's faster than you'd expect, and he can teleport between three different areas of the map, so that start area isn't safe anymore as soon as you wake him up. You can also telefrag him, but that would take forever. We're not doing that. Nah, I'm kidding, let's telefrag him. <laughs> Most impressive. Oh, thanks, man. Hey, are you behind this horrible screaming wall of ominous light that probably leads to a terrifying dimension of evil and corruption? 